We're excited to have Mike with us. Mike was a long time Wisconsin Department of Natural Resource toxicologist and uh, research scientist. Uh, currently, he is working with NOVA uh, Ecological Services. Uh, Mike got a PhD in wildlife ecology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, worked with the DNR for, for decades in, in toxicology, lakeshore habitat restoration, and climate change in the Northern Highlands. Uh, since retiring, Mike has been working with uh, Nova Ecological Services around the Northern Highlands area, consulting on assorted projects, including this one, the, the Tomahawk Lake Association Shoreline Restoration Work. So, Mike, with that, uh, hopefully you can unmute yourself, and thanks again for joining us today. Oops. Happy to. Um, I just see the speaker view on my screen. Yeah, we're not seeing this, the slides yet, Patrick. Oh, I got to share it. Sorry. Me. Do that for you and we will be off and running. There we go. Mike, please take it away. Okay, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is a uh, project we did for the Tomahawk Lake Association back in 2019. It's uh, sponsored by the Tomahawk Lake Association and a Wisconsin DNR Lake Planning Grant. Next slide. Uh, the project goal is kind of uh, tied into Paul Radomsky's talk in that we're trying to use a bottom-up approach to encourage private and public landowners to implement shoreland best management practices, particularly in ecologically sensitive shoreland areas of Tomahawk Lake. What our assumption is, is that by increasing the knowledge of the ecologically important features of Tomahawk Lake, landowners near these sites will be encouraged to adopt these practices. Uh, we're hoping to show them specifically what's in it for them. Oftentimes the uh, top-down approach skips that uh, point. Next slide. So uh, what we did uh, was using DNR uh, assets at the Rhinelander office uh, from the Fish and Wildlife uh, Manager's desks, and also by conducting our own shoreland surveys, we mapped all the critical fish and habitat wildlife on Tomahawk Lake and created a GIS map of that. In addition, uh, we uh, created a GIS map of the shoreland conditions at each individual tax parcel adjacent to Tomahawk Lake, all 410 of them. Uh, we are using these two GIS maps to identify which properties uh, near uh, the shoreline have observed surface water runoff, erosion, and or habitat loss. Uh, we wanted to identify those properties to target our education and outreach efforts to promote the uh, best management practices. And we wanted to prioritize our outreach by focusing on impaired properties that are near the uh, critical habitat features. Next slide. So first, uh, to create the GIS map of the um, critical habitat areas, we used a draft protocol developed by uh, Paul Cunningham in 2008 that the DNR follows to identify critical habitat uh, areas of lakes for specific designations. Uh, this is how we created the GIS map and on Tomahawk Lake, we identified 39 of these critical habitat features. Next slide. Uh, this is just the cover of the critical habitat designation manual that was put together by Paul Cunningham. Next slide. So uh, uh, the features that we are interested in identifying uh, on Tomahawk Lake are uh, fish and fish habitat that are providing functional needs for spawning, nursery, feeding, and cover, specifically coarse woody cover, uh, rock gravel, rubble substrate, and areas of a high aquatic plant diversity. We also wanted to identify shoreland habitat that was important and critical for wildlife and wildlife habitat, uh, including lake dependent upland wildlife, fur bearers, birds, frogs, toads and turtles, and snakes. Uh, it is a function of the riparian type and character, the wetland type present, and the amount of coarse woody cover. We also wanted to identify areas that are important for uh, maintaining high water quality on Tomahawk Lake. Does the site serve as a nutrient or physical buffer zone? 
and or does it stabilize sediment? We also wanted to identify the important wetland features and uh, shoreland areas that were uh, deemed to have natural scenic beauty. Next slide. So these are um, uh, the locations of the 39th uh, critical habitat sites on Tomahawk Lake. This is the north half of the lake. Next slide. Uh, next, okay, and these are the uh, critical habitat sites on the southern area of the lake. Tomahawk Lake is uh, 3,000 acres, but it's in really uh, good shape because much of the southern uh, shoreland areas is in state or public ownership. Next slide. For each of these 39 critical habitat sites, we uh, produced a map of the critical habitat area. We described uh, it physically. Next slide. We uh, uh, came up with a critical habitat value for each of these sites. In this case, it uh, attained all six uh, habitat qualities as you can see listed here. And then for each of the 39 sites, we provided management recommendations. So all 39 of these uh, critical habitat narratives are compiled in a critical habitat manual for Tomahawk Lake. Next slide. Uh, this is just an example of the types of maps we generated. As I mentioned, we uh, use DNR uh, habitat maps that were kept in the wildlife and fisheries uh, managers offices, but we also in this case mapped all the coarse woody habitat on uh, Tomahawk Lake. Each of those little blue dots represents coarse wood habitat and we followed the uh, DNR protocol for identifying those and used a GPS uh, and a uh, boat survey to identify all these spots. And in orange are all the critical habitat areas. Next slide. And we uh, identified as we were doing these uh, shoreland surveys, all the rock and rubble substrate along the shoreline that uh, poses uh, good spawning areas for white sucker and walleye and smallmouth bass. And once again, those are in red and you can see those juxtaposed to the critical habitat sites that we designated. Next slide. Uh, we were fortunate in having uh, a data set uh, uh, that the Tomahawk Lake Associ Association already had. Uh, it was a um, point intercept survey conducted by Harmony Environmental in uh, 2014, which had allowed us to map out all the areas of Tomahawk Lake that have diverse aquatic plant communities. Next slide. Uh, we used the uh, DNR wetland maps to identify important wetland features as well as uh, by conducting our own surveys. Next slide. Next, we went on to uh, do the uh, uh, surveys of the shoreland condition. We began by conducting a survey to identify high concentration human use locations on Tomahawk Lake. And what I mean by those are sites where during our surveys, we found at least 15 people at properties uh, adjacent to the shoreline, as well as commercial operations. Next slide. We identified uh, eight of these sites. Uh, this is the northern part of the lake. Uh, some of these were actually uh, DNR campground sites. So uh, it wasn't just commercial private sector um, areas that we identified as high human use. Next slide. And this represents the uh, southern part of the lake. And as you can see, the locations of the sites are in juxtaposition to the orange shaded areas, which are the critical habitat sites. Next slide. So for each of these uh, high concentration areas, we put together a uh, description of what we observed as we were doing our surveys as far as impacts on the shoreline and the commercial operations. And uh, we uh, provided some recommendations as to how to mitigate some of the impacts. Next slide. Once we have identified all the high concentration human use areas, we went on to survey each of the individual uh, properties adjacent to Tomahawk Lake using the DNR shall, uh, Shoreland and Shallows Habitat Monitoring Field Protocol. Uh, 
And we use these uh, surveys to create another GIS map. Next slide. Here's the uh, front cover of the uh, DNR protocol. Next slide. And uh, during the shoreland inventory mapping, we did it by boat. We surveyed the entire lake over the course of two weeks, and we um, encountered 410 properties in the process. And at each property, we identified or we described the riparian buffer. We identified ongoing erosion and runoff concerns. We evaluated the bank zone. We um, described human modifications of the littoral and shoreland area and we made note of aquatic plant presence. Once again, this all follows the protocol uh, that the DNR put together. Next slide. These are the uh, 410 parcels that we stopped at. Each site we visited for about five minutes. Uh, it, it's a quick survey process. We followed uh, the uh, description of how to do this from the DNR. We did some calibrations before we went out into the field. But at each site, uh, next slide. Oh, this is the southern half of the lake. So as you can see, we had a lot of properties to visit. Next slide. And each column represents one individual tax parcel. And we went down their checkoff list and described all the various uh, aspects that you can see listed here. And we followed the coding that the DNR provided. And once again, this is a, a kind of a SWAT team approach where you are. Um, going to the entire lake quickly. The point is to identify areas that have obvious problems or apparent obvious problems as seen from the boat to highlight these for education and outreach and then to um, uh, schedule uh, follow-up site visits if um, the property owners are interested. Next slide. So here's a map showing once again in orange the uh, critical habitat sites that we mapped in the uh, initial surveys. And uh, in brown are the actual tax parcels where we observed gullying and channeled runoff. Um, we are making the point to the property owners that these have the potential of impacting not only their water quality, but also the silting uh, can uh, um, cause problems with the spawning habitat for walleye. Next slide. Uh, these parcels are those that we observed with bank erosion. Once again, uh, an overall goal of the project is to uh, reduce surface water runoff and nutrient and sediment runoff in the process. So as you can see, these green sites are in some cases in close proximity to these critical habitat sites. So we will be reaching out to these property owners with that information. Next slide. And these sites are those with uh, what we described as uh, degraded buffer habitat in that uh, these are sites where over 40% of the shoreline was either impervious surface or manicured lawn or both. So as you can see, once again, there are uh, quite a few sites that are in close proximity to critical habitat sites. Next slide. So bringing it all together, we wanted to uh, take all the information from the critical habitat GIS map and the shoreline condition map to help us uh, prioritize our education and outreach um, program. Next slide. So as you can see here, this is a zoom into uh, the northern shore of the lake. The parcels in light green are those that have degraded buffers. And if you can see on the right hand side, uh, TL8 is an area of critical uh, uh, walleye habitat spawning area. And just to the north of it are uh, properties without uh, um, good buffers. So you can envision reaching out to these property owners individually with information that they are in close proximity to a critical habitat site. And for these reasons, uh, a buffer would be uh, a, a great improvement to their property. Once again, using the bottom up approach, uh, instead of enforcing these buffers on the folks, showing what's in it for them, why it's important to the lake, et cetera. On the upper uh, area on the north side, there's a uh, TL7, which is a uh, diverse aquatic plant community. Once again, sites without buffers and uh, 
In addition, there's some sites with bank erosion. So once again, reach out to those property owners, share with them the uh, information that they reside next to an area that's important to the lake from the standpoint of aquatic plants. And these are the practices they could use on their properties to improve uh, their relationship to this critical habitat site. Next slide. And then once again on the South Shore, uh, TL26 is a great rock um, um, uh, spawning area, a reef area for uh, walleye. And just to the west of it are a variety of properties that have degraded uh, um, buffers or runoff issues, either from the bank erosion or surface water runoff. And once again, uh, LT63, this is actually a state of Wisconsin property, which receives a lot of public use. People moor their pontoon boats off the shoreline there and uh, scramble up and down the bank. And there's a heck of a lot of uh, gullying and uh, surface water runoff there. And TL26 is a great spawning area for walleye. So uh, we, won't, we will reach out not only to the private landowners, but uh, to the DNR as well and show them that these sites could use some improvement. Next slide. Now, when we uh, got the GIS layer from Oneida County, uh, it includes for each of the parcels, individual um, tax parcels, uh, the property owner's name, their address, Etc. The idea is not to um, publicize these lists to share with the other property owners on the lake and shame people into good behavior, but rather to use this list to uh, for our own use for education and outreach. These are the folks that we will uh, send our outreach packages to or make contact with. In this case, these are the sites where we observed gullying and channeled runoff. By the way, we are going to let people know when we reach out that uh, this is our observation from a boat. It's not necessarily something that has been verified and we would ask them if they're uh, willing to allow us to come do a site visit to verify that what we actually saw was uh, a condition that's occurring and also to make uh, site specific recommendations. Next slide. So uh, recommendations for use of this report, we um, shared with the Tomahawk Lake Association nine recommendations of how they can use this information. And I um, put together the top three to share with you today. Next slide. The first is uh, we recommend that they uh, post this project report, which is quite uh, voluminous, uh, on their website. Uh, we want a standalone four page summary. Then we'd like them to publish the body of the report and then uh, to provide them a manual of the critical habitat narrative. So the uh, property owners uh, or Lake Association members can view all three of these products. Uh, when we do post the body of the report, I am going to likely remove the maps of the specific properties where we observe the problems. We don't want people to take a defensive posture right from the start because they'll go right to their own property to see how it was um, designated. Rather, we want to use those maps to um, identify which property owners we want to reach out to. Once again, those that are in close proximity to the critical habitat sites are the first we will uh, reach out to. And uh, the goal is to uh, facilitate uh, um, adaptation of these practices, not to force them on the property owners. Then uh, second, uh, we're, we need to yet put together our Shoreland Steward Education Outreach Package. Um, and uh, some of the uh, uh, products that we're thinking of sharing with the property owners are uh, information on the critical habitat sites near their property, and also a link to and instructions for the Tomahawk Lake Association Shoreland Steward Program Rate Your Shoreland Survey, where the property owner can go through, as um, was uh, Paul showed on a lake in Minnesota, uh, folks can rate their own shoreline and get a, a score on that. Uh, we, we're gonna look at the education outreach materials from the UW Extension Lakes Program, and uh, 
we're also putting together a site assessment protocol for going to the individual properties and providing the uh, property owners maps of their own property as well as uh, designating the areas that could use improvement. And uh, also pointing them towards the Wisconsin Healthy Lakes grant opportunities and best management recommendations. Now, as we look at Tomahawk Lake, we saw several areas of the shoreline where neighbors are in close proximity to each other and to critical habitat sites where we feel uh, a group approach might be a good way to reach out to these property owners such that uh, we could mail them a uh, flyer uh, describing their location of their property and uh, the importance of their property to this critical habitat area and offer them the opportunity to uh, get together with their neighbors and one of our experts and uh, have a discussion about what improvements could occur on that part of the lake to protect that critical habitat site. So that's what uh, we have at the moment. We finished the survey projects. Next slide. And we've uh, um, given the uh, final product reports to the Tomahawk Lake Association and we're in the process of developing our education and outreach strategy. So uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take some. Mike, to what extent do those materials you produced have value as educational materials for other lakes? Are they general enough that they might be exported to other lakes without the specific surveys? Uh -huh. um, well, I think it could be used as a model, you know, for other lakes to um, follow. Yes. I think, you know, the, the value in this project is to individualize the information so that the property owners can see what is in it for them. You know, are, how can they improve the lake uh, water quality and uh, habitat value individually on their properties? So I, I, that's my perspective. We're, we're looking at it um, as one that targets individual property 